You're listening to the Wired for Impact podcast. I'm here with Eric Rogers. Eric, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I came across your story online and uh, immediately I was like, oh, you know, there's some, there's there's a really powerful story here. Um, I saw that just a glimpse of it on one of your social media posts and it intrigued me to have you on the podcast and hear more about it in the the trials and tribulations, as they say, to be where you're at today. So first and foremost, thank you for taking the time. And uh, for those that don't know who you are, you're growing your audience, which is awesome. But um, there's a lot of people that don't know who you are just yet. So why don't you do an introduction and we'll get into your story. Awesome. Yeah. Well, obviously, I'm Eric Rogers and I'm on a mission to develop Christian men into influential and successful leaders by unlocking their God-given potential. And um, it is a journey, not only for, for everybody that we're coaching, but for myself as well. You know, we're never going to be perfect, uh, but we could always do better. And it's really about becoming more obedient and more disciplined so that God can use us in bigger and greater ways, right? Outside of our family unit, you know, out in the world, because if you could see the state of the world right now, it's not in a, a great place. It really never has been. But I believe that men, not all, but the ones that are, are called to do greater things and to glorify God in the things that they do. And, you know, to to bring men confidence in themselves enough to do that is really our job. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the state of the world. What in your mind, for those that I'm still amazed at how people don't recognize what's going on. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge that there's a lot of shit going on and it's hard to know what's true. It's hard to know what's not true. People are extremely busy. They've got their own stresses. So I, on one hand, I understand that, you know, sometimes people have their heads down and they're just trying to get to the next day. So for those that may not be in touch with some of the things that are happening that I think you and I might be seeing, why don't you share from your perspective, what you see going on in the world? I see there, a, there's a big shift in leadership. Um, I think we've always had, you know, a lack of good leadership in our country, in our world. Um, although I believe that we're, we're, we're watching in society is a generation of fatherless people, right? Which in well, statistically causes a lot of problems, right? We, we see a lot of like women stepping up into the masculine role, which I, I certainly believe that's a defense mechanism and it's a natural defense mechanism so that they can be protected. Um, because men are stepping more into a feminine role, right? We could see there's, you know, a big, there's a lot of shaming on masculinity, calling it toxic and really putting men down to a place where we're, we're, I, wanna, I don't even want to use the word oppressed. I don't even, you know what I mean? I don't want to use that word, but silenced is definitely um, something that we have felt. But in the same time, there's a pushback, right? There's a lot of guys like me stepping up into the world and, and being an example, men not taking their natural place as a as a leader and one that leads by example, not one that just tells people what to do, but a man that leads by example, that has good morals, that loves Christ, that lives to serve others and make their circle or their community a better place is definitely lacking. And that causes all sorts of problems, right? Mm -hmm. and, and as far as us making this world a better place as, as much as, you know, men putting on their boots and going out and working and providing and protecting for the things that they believe in and love. We're seeing that start to collapse. And a quote I heard the other day, which is really good. is like, if we don't let men lead, then we're letting Satan lead. Mm. There's no if, ands, or buts on that. I want to come back to that a little bit later in the conversation, but before okay. I do that, let's go back to your origin story, where you started, how you got to where you are today, because it's it's quite a trek. <laughs> yeah, so my story has all sorts of darkness. I really didn't see much light until about 24 years old. I'm 30 now. Um, there was a, a significant moment in my life that changed the course of everything, right? Something that a child should never go through. I was actually molested in my church at seven years old. Um, not really understanding, you know, at that age, what was going all on. All I knew that it was, a sh it was very shameful and I did not want to talk about it. And it pushed me into a place of disrespecting and not trusting authority. Right. And one of the things that is cool. And one of the things we, we do with our clients is we look at our past to see what our purpose is, 
right? We look at some of the traumas we've been through and it's like, I believe that God places things in your life so that we can fix that exact problem as adults, right? To become who we always needed in our darkest times. That's why I developed leaders is because I had such a mistrust for authority, right? Because something that like that, that can happen to any of our children will destroy their life. And I would say about 98% of those children are never going to come out of that, right? I'm one of the blessed ones, um, not to mention to be molested in a church and to still love Christ to this day is even more rare, right? Yeah. You know, that being said, I, if you look at my family from an outside perspective, you would see a, a good, loving, strong Christian family, right? And, and those things are true. But because my perspective was flawed because of the trauma that I went through, I was now a victim and that put me in positions my entire life that placed me into more and more and more and more darkness mm -hmm. and because my perspective was I'm not good enough or, um, you know, I didn't trust authority and, you know, my behavior changed. Um, I started using drugs at eight years old and mm -hmm. that carried on to the age of 24. And I can truly say that. I use drugs to keep me alive. So there's people that use drugs for pleasure. And then there's people that use drugs for purpose, right? And, and I believe that addiction really starts when, when you're uh, running away from pain, pain that you don't want to face. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't really understand what the whole, you know, it was such a repressed memory at this point in my life. And it's something I've tapped back into and I've absolutely healed from. But at that age, I felt shame, pain, hurt and discuss and i use drugs to make me feel normal and it can works I, can i ask you a question if you don't mind me asking was this a one-time event or what did this happen con you know consecutively over some it was a one-time event and i'll tell you why um it was a woman first of all it was a woman in our church and um you know i knew i had to go back every single week right and this is actually a big reason why I didn't tell anybody is I actually put bleach in her coffee the next week mm. and she got deathly sick. She did not die. Um, but I, I remember and I can laugh about this. I remember my mom always saying, like, stay away from the bleach. It's poisonous. And I took that that and I put a cap full inside of her coffee. I, mm. I poured it, some bleach in a cap when I was seven at home, wrapped it in saran wrap, took it to church and wow. I poured it. Yeah, it's crazy, right? I wanted to to deal with it myself and because I I did not want that to happen again. And because she got really sick, I was afraid that I'd get in trouble. And so I kept that memory to myself, but she never did it again. Mm -hmm. She never did it again, right? And mm -hmm. I would find ways to go into the church like to service with my parents and sit there, and, you know, I would cause whatever ruckus I could in that <laughs> in Sunday school so I didn't have to be there, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ran away multiple times, whatever I could to protect myself. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it was it was that moment in my life that put me into an ultra survival protective state for. Yeah. I, and I would think that that would completely invert your I mean, your whole family is focused on uh, Christianity as a foundation. And yet that idea was manipulated and perverted in such a way in your experience yep. that it became the very thing that you wanted to rebel against. I would imagine that would create a little bit of conflict in your family. Yeah. Um, it, it, <laughs> yeah. It what, what was, what was that like? How did your family, did, did they know when did they find out? They didn't find out till um, the beginning of last year, actually is the first time I came out with it. Wow. Um, on a wow. podcast, actually, the first time oh I ever talked gosh. about it was on a podcast. I didn't even tell my wife. I was like, you know what? It's time. It was like God put it on my heart. And you know how many people reached out to me and were like, dude, I've been through this. Like, this is crazy. Right. And so many people were relating to it. And they're like, this, this is the coolest part about this testimony is that now as an adult that owns a, a Christ centered business, right, that that serves God every day, that loves Christ. I, I can tell this story because a lot of people, you know, they have walked away from God because of something that happened in the church. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be like a molestation or anything like that, but there is a lot of judgment. There's a lot of hypocrisy, right, in churches, and we've all probably felt that, judged or whatever. And it's pushed people away from the church, which really pushes people away from God. Mm -hmm. And through this story, I can tell people that 
my perspective that dude, I'm gifted. First of all, God gifted me with faith. He gifted me with faith. I feel like I was chosen because most people would not, mm -hmm. would not follow Christ after that. Now mm -hmm. I went through much destruction and darkness from that moment to 24 years old. Can I ask you what, what your low point was? Sorry to, to, yeah, to derail you, but I want to make sure that people understand sort of yeah. how, how far you've come. So 17 years old, I'm addicted to cocaine and I'm still living at my parents' house. I, I've been in multiple fights at school. I was a very isolated drug user, but it, it was a way for me to, to keep doing it as if I sold it, make me enough money to get enough drugs to keep going. Um, I started getting introduced to certain gangs out in here in California that, you know, were pretty heavy into selling cocaine. And I, I started selling for them. And I got heavily addicted to cocaine. My father found cocaine inside of my backpack just a little bit. And my father was a uh, Folsom prison guard, actually, for mm. about 30 years. Mm. So, um, you you know, he wasn't the kind of guy that was like, here, let's get you help. He's like, get out of my house. You got, he's, he's like, get out of my house from calling the cops, right? So I, I got kicked out at 17. I went over to stay with a friend's house. Devils chased me everywhere, man. <laughs> I went over to stay at a friend's house on his couch. I wake up the next morning and I, I'm telling him, I'm like, I got to quit doing drugs. Hey, look what it's doing to my life. And I've had, to, had these convictions, but every time I tried to quit, like the devil would come in hotter. Right. And this is what he does. So my friend pulls out a baggie and he's like, you want to bump right after that story? <laughs> and I'm like, sure. Cause I'm an addict. And of course I want drugs. And you know, I take it, I take a bump and it burns really bad. I'm like, this is not, this doesn't feel right. And he was like, how long have you been doing methamphetamine? And that was the first time I ever touched crystal methamphetamine i got really mad i left i came over that night and started smoking it so you you thought it was uh cocaine and yeah I, okay i thought it was cocaine it was so methamphetamine not... i got okay. mad i left and i spent the whole day kind of like feeling it tweaking out like deciding i can't do this anymore but i like this and then i call them up and i come back that night and i start smoking it right and so I spent a, a year and a half in heavy addiction of methamphetamine. I started selling methamphetamine because that was my game, right? The evil in methamphetamine is crazy. It's insane. I believe that it's from the time we're born that we are seeking some type of family. We're seeking some type of identity. We're seeking acknowledgement, understanding, right? And drugs mm -hmm. give you that. And addicts give you that, right? You all have a common purpose. You're accepted for who you are. And it's like the family you never had. Well, mm -hmm. I got introduced to one of the no most notorious prison gangs in California. And I started distributing for them. And I got mixed in heavily with the gang affiliation out here in Sacramento. And man, the evil, the amount of evil things I've seen from that drug. I mean, I I watched mothers trade their three-year-old daughters for 20 sacks of methamphetamine. Wow. For an hour, you know what I mean? For sex. Yeah. I've watched kids be trafficked. I've watched people get killed. I've watched I mean everything known to man. The stuff you would see on a movie, you're like, you know, you wouldn't expect it in real life. I've seen it. I've been there and I did nothing about it. Right. And mm -hmm. so through these experiences in my life, chasing a high, looking for my identity, finding family, right? And, and you know, just trying to figure out where I belong. I got pulled into the most darkest places a man should ever go, right? And and it got to a place where the guilt and the shame just weighed so heavily on me that I started using more and more and more. And I got to the point where I was at drug-induced psychosis, for months at a time, I was the guy on the side of the road screaming at cars. I was the guy, you know, you see the homeless guy just being weird. That was yep. me. I'd be on the floor with a knife picking white rocks out of the asphalt because I thought they were crystal meth and I would try to smoke them. I remember having moments where I'd blink and I'd wake up in other cities and I didn't know what reality was. Like I was seeing demons. I was seeing, well, I was, I remember seeing my dad in trees, bro. <laughs> crazy stuff right not eating or sleeping for multiple weeks and the the four percent of people that use 
methamphetamine regularly quit only four percent mm. yeah it is mm. the most addicting drug and it and it's the most addicting drug because you can live for a long time on it too Wow. You just shared a very powerful uh, visual of what it's like to be on it. And this is just my curiosity brain because you do see people yelling at things or whatever. What is that person actually experiencing? And part of the reason why I ask this is like, is there any reaching that person? Is there any way to? Absolutely yeah, not. Ca- yeah. Yeah. Absolutely not. And I'll tell you this in, in myself personally, there was no to, way to reach me even if I was sober. Like I was an unreachable person. Any form of authority that came into my life, I immediately would walk away from. I never listened to authority. And that was a big part of going to the places I went is I never received help. I never asked for it, never wanted it. Why? Because of what happened to me at seven years old. Mm -hmm. It it wired me to isolate and to run to weaker people and to be validated. You know what I mean? For my soul to be destroyed by more and more drugs. And this is the life of an addict. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the life of an addict. Well, it, what's so interesting about this story too is you did have a family unit. You did have a uh, church in your life. You did have some um, at least attempts at uh, of a foundation. And yet you also said that you found family in your addict friends. If you don't mind me asking, did you not have that support at home? It sounds like your father was a pretty uh, tough individual. My dad was tough. And my dad grew up without parents you know, both his parents were addicts and they died at a young age, mm. both killed themselves by the time he was 13. Wow. My dad lived on the streets. My mother's a sweetheart. She grew up in a really Catholic family, six kids. You know what I mean? Like the good old strong American family. My dad did the best that he could with me. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. And even though it wasn't what I would say is good. um, my Now I have a great relationship with my father. Is there things I would have done different? Absolutely. My dad having that childhood and being a disciplinarian and me constantly disobeying authority, you know, Constant to me, yeah, to me, it felt like abuse. Right. And mm-hmm. I'm coming. This is a non-victim mindset as an adult. Now I have a son and it, I've healed from these things. Right. For a long time, I blame my dad for everything. It's like mm-hmm. he doesn't understand. He didn't know what happened to me as a kid. I was just acting out and he was disciplining me. In my perspective, I'm like, he hates me. Everyone hates me. No one loves me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and we got to realize that, that, you know, we have to do our best to see out of other people's eyes. Like, we don't always understand what are, is going through other people's, you know, minds. And sometimes helping isn't always disciplining. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things I do with my son on a daily basis is I make him feel safe enough to tell me how he feels. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Of course, there is a lot. There's discipline where I'm a father. He's my son. You know, I'm going to raise a strong man, but I'm also going to teach him love as well and empathy mm-hmm. and, and let him be heard and known. Because what I didn't have is a way to express my emotions in a way that didn't drive me into drug addiction. Right. Mm-hmm. Because every time I felt emotion, I would get high. You know, you're bringing up something that's so powerful for parents to hear because unwanted behavior by children comes down to that they don't feel seen and heard and they don't know how to express that because they're young because they haven't developed the articulation the self-awareness etc and so they act out and and parents come in with hard i've seen ah it's so frustrating i see fathers come in with such a heavy hand and i can just see that little boy just getting crushed but also the anger and resentment building and the pushback and you just have constant conflict so i love that example it's very powerful if we could go back to when you were a teenager there and you were on the streets you got involved with gang culture you're distributing drugs you talked about that low point where you got addicted to meth let's pick it up from there so my turning point and this wasn't the turning point this is just one right i've lost (laughs) everything in my life three times now so i've had three rock bottoms in my life and the first one wasn't enough. But I, at the age of 18, almost 19 years old, I got caught with enough uh, controlled substance to put myself in prison for 10 years. And I, I, when I was sitting in my cell in Sac County Jail, waiting on my, my court date, it was the first time since eight years old that I was sober. Mm. And this is, this is, uh, it was very eye-opening because I realized that like this isn't that bad. 
right it was like sober is not that bad yeah it was like this wasn't that bad now i was in a cave basically by myself just Mm -hmm. in my own thoughts but it was the first time in my life i've really been sober and i remember starting to have a relationship with god in that cell Mm -hmm. and i've had a relationship with god through my childhood but i wasn't always in obedience with him i knew god I, i love god I believe in God, but he wasn't my drug. That was a moment where I I had some clarity in my life. And I remember talking to a a correctional officer and he was like, what are you doing here? Because I I was 18 years old. I was about 125 pounds sucked up. My eyes were getting sucked in the back of my head. I looked like a tweaker. I was not doing good, unhealthy. And he just looked at me. He's like, bro, you're going to get eaten up in here. And I was just like, it clicked. I was like, what am I doing? My dad was a prison guard. You know, my dad literally came to work to, you know, (laughs) correct people like me. Mm -hmm. And I became this, like this monster. And it was like a moment, an awakening. And so I, I decided then I was going to make a change. When I got out of jail, I spent two weeks in jail and I, I had to go to my trial. So I was in trial for multiple months and I was slipping. Sometimes it wasn't perfect, but I actually won my trial and I wasn't convicted of anything. And that was a moment that I decided that, look, I got to leave. I I packed my bags. I threw my cell phone away. I had about $40, a box of chili, a tarp and, (laughs) and my guitar and my Bible. And I, I drove up to Truckee, California and I lived in the forest, 10 miles down a dirt road for, for four months. Good and God, man. The, the things that a, a young single man can live off of, you literally know, just right? gave the list. A box of chili, a tent, uh, I'm good, and a guitar. I'm, that's all I need. <laughs> yeah, that's that hilarious. was my detox, right? Wow, wow. And that was, that's when I got off uh, methamphetamine, man. I, I was writing songs out there. I was reading the Bible every day. Wow. I was, you know, building forts. I was doing all sorts of cool stuff. It was the most transformative process in my life, and I needed that. I needed to get away from my environment. So you set out the intention to detox, right? Yeah, Am I saying that correctly? And and really quickly, so when you were in prison and you started that relationship yeah. with God or jail, yeah. sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. was it was that? Um, did you seek that out? Did, what did did you just wake up at night and and heard a voice? Like how did you how did you develop that? It was just prayer, man. It was just like I know God exists. Because in a lot of my trials, like it, I've had moments in my life, where I've guns to my head, knives to my throat, and you know, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm gonna die. And I just knew, I always had this feeling like God was there. I always knew that throughout my entire life, and that's mm-hmm. that's that saying like God, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, right? I accepted Jesus at a young age, but just wasn't living in obedience with Him. Mm-hmm. And in like my darkest moments like that in the cell, I just knew he was there and I had somebody to talk to. Right. Mm-hmm. And I just had, a, I had faith and that was enough, man. I could tell you like the love of Jesus, when you haven't felt love your entire life is the most beautiful thing ever. It changes your heart. Right. And I, um, yeah, my faith just came from just past experience and, and knowing like there's something else here. I had a little mm-hmm. bit of hope. Okay, but you, so you were you were reaching out through prayer. You had the faith that there was somebody listening. So okay, so you're detoxing. I, w- I want to get to the love of Jesus because uh, that's what actually compelled me to reach out to you in the Facebook post that I saw. So uh, this is such a fascinating story. I haven't heard the whole story yet, so this I'm receiving it for the first time that our listeners yeah. are too. So uh, go on, you're you're detoxing with your chili. Yeah, so I'm in. Yeah, I ran out of chili, by the way. Um, <laughs> I had my guitar, I had old guitar strings. I I built snares. I caught squirrels. We cooked squirrels. Like it was, it was good, bro. Um, and four Sound months like a later, yeah. <laughs> four months later, I uh, I went into town. I started looking for a job. I I got a job as a camp camp counselor, and then I, you know, got a job at the gym. I wasn't doing drugs anymore. I smoked some weed. I was in Tahoe. You know what I mean? I wasn't fully. You know, here's the thing: is that my quitting of addiction was my way it wasn't god's way right god's way says to be in fellowship and to have accountability and to and to repent and and have jesus deliver you from these addictions for me it was like just discipline just don't do it escape Mm -hmm. run away from it you know what i mean Mm -hmm. which worked quite a bit but if you you know the rest of my story you'll see that i i always go back 
I keep relapsing. I keep relapsing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'd have these stretches of sobriety and I had a stretch of sobriety. Then I met my wife, which is my ex-wife now. And um, we fell in love. And that was like the first time I ever felt love from a person in my life. So I became attached to her. We built a life together. I had a kid, uh, my son, Levi, he's six now, but when he was one years old, I slipped back into addiction pretty hard. I was doing pills. I was drinking alcohol. I was doing whatever I really could. And, you know, to the point where I woke up one day and my wife had her bags packed. And this is eight years after I detoxed in the, in the woods. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had multiple of these and she just had enough, man. I had destroyed my family unit through my addiction and I never fully properly healed from my past. I just kept running from it mm. and it kept coming back. And then I would cope with that pain with the drugs and alcohol. And I lost my son and my wife and I woke up, their bags were packed. She's like, I never want to see you again. They moved out of state away from me. And I spent the next four months just hitting the bottle as hard as I could you know, meeting girls, doing drugs, doing everything. I just having the time of my life, but it got me to the point where I was sitting on my bed four months later with the, with the handle of whiskey in one hand and a Glock 23 in my mouth with the finger on the trigger. Mm -hmm. And it was that moment, nothing was going good in my life. Right. I was that guy that was getting drunk and having a good time. But when I was, when the reality would hit me, I was done. Like I had no happiness. It was, it was so fake. It was so, and I just was alone. I had nobody there. And me being this victim as 24 years old, me being this victim, my thoughts were like, nobody loves me. Life sucks. Everything I touch goes to crap. And I'm sitting there and I got nobody to call. That's a fact. And I got nobody to leave a note to. And I'm sitting there with the gun in my mouth loaded, just crying and sobbing. And I just drool and snot coming out of my, my face because I knew this was it. And I go to squeeze the trigger and I had a vision and it wasn't a good one. It wasn't like, ah. it was the vision of my son calling someone else dad, mm. you know, and, and my wife being loved by another man. And it was enough to remember my entire childhood and remember that if my dad was there and he loved me and he showed love to me and he he scooped me up and he told me i got you let's figure this out instead of just discipline 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 yeah then i would have probably been a different man at that moment and I knew that if I wasn't there for my son, that the chances of him sitting on his bed with the gun in his mouth are so high. Right. And and it's a truth. That's a fatherless society. Suicides are up. Drug addictions are up. And I, I just had a realization. I'm so selfish, bro. You know, I'm mm -hmm. so selfish. And it was enough to pull that gun out of my mouth. And I, I just remember saying, like, no, I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be that. And I didn't know how. I was so addicted, bro. I've tried so many times and I failed. Like, so I gave myself a year. I told, I promised myself if I'm not, if I don't haven't built a life that I am pleased with in a year, I'm just going to end it. So I, I promised myself, I'm going to give it a year. And in a year I'm going to, I'm going to kill myself. And I, I did it, bro. <laughs> I did it. So, I mean, that was a moment I did kill my old self. And I, I remember waking up the next day and, Something was different. I had this mm -hmm. desire. I had hope. I was like, I was, I just wanted to be the dad I always needed to be. And I wanted to be back in my wife's life. And I remember just, I, I woke up and first day I was hungover. So I was like, rest. Second day, you know, I go get a gym membership and I start working out twice a day. And then, you know, week two, I start waking up super early and reading the Bible every morning. And then week four, I'm waking up, I'm reading the Bible, I'm journaling. And then I go home after work, after the gym, and I'm reading the Bible again. And I created just this extremely structured life, right? And for mm -hmm. the, the next six months, I, I practiced this life. It changed my life, bro. It was just, just the habits alone completely changed who I am. 
Right. And then I, I realized, hey, I can't do this alone like I did. I can't just run away from everyone and go hide in the woods and kill squirrels, bro. Like that only works for a little while. So I need to be around people. So I remember I found a church and I started going to a men's Bible study. And I, I remember sitting there with these guys and just asking them questions like, how do we how do you guys live normal lives? Like I did. I had no idea. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'd never lived a normal life. Like, how do you guys deal with stress and lust? And, you know, these guys were like. They're really boring, dude. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie; they're so <laughs> boring. And I, uh, I, I knew I didn't want to be like I didn't want to be boring. <laughs> yeah, I knew I couldn't be. Like God yeah. wasn't calling me to be just like normal. I'm an intense guy. I'm going to use that. That's a gift. Yeah. But I also needed to learn how to have some self control. Mm-hmm. And so I moved into one of those guys' basement, and one of his rules was no drugs, no alcohol, no girls. And so I had accountability. I had a place to sleep every night where I knew I can't mess around or I'm going to get kicked out. He had kids and a wife. You know, it was enough accountability to just keep me on track. Hmm. I remember calling my wife six months later and I'm like, hey, I'm better. She's like, what do you mean? I said, this is what I've been doing for six months. This is who I am. I didn't call her that entire time. I didn't even see my son. I saw my son once in that six months. Hmm. I was like, I want you back. And she's like, come to California. And that's why I'm in California now. Unfortunately, we didn't work out, um, but that's fine, you know. And I came and I'm in my son's life every single day. And it's like, if simply put, I didn't do that. God did that. I believe since the time we are born, we are all seeking the kingdom of heaven. And we find it in other things. We find it in drugs and money and titles and cars and and, and success and validation. And that's why you always hear people say it's never enough, right? You hit your goal. You want another goal. You want, you, you, you make a lot of money. It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. Right. And it's a fact what that hole is meant for is God, our father, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the father that I wanted to be to my son, the father that I wanted my dad to be for me, who was only going to be established by Christ. And when I when I started to learn and understand who Jesus was, I, and I learned that I had a dad that was there the whole time. I may not have recognized him, but he was there and he never left me and he never forsake me. He never kicked me out of his home. You know what I mean? He never mm-hmm. disciplined me for not being good enough. Mm-hmm. He never told me I wasn't good enough. I just wasn't paying attention to him. And so Christ came in my life as my father, right? Filled that hole and also gave me a perfect example of the man that I need to be for my son, not just Mm -hmm. a better version of myself. No, to have the character of Christ. And I'm never going to get there, of course, because he's perfect. Although I believe that as men who are called, as men who, who call themselves children of God, followers of Christ, that as soon as you take in that name, that God's number one goal with you is to develop you into the character of of his son, sacrificial, self-controlled. I mean, I can name off all the fruits of the spirits, patience, peaceful, kindness, compassionate. And, And we have that example with us. But what we do is we look to the world for answers way too much. And that's what I did my entire life, right? And it just leads us to that place on your knees, nobody around, feeling betrayed, feeling lost. And if we just look up, we're at the base of the cross. Jesus is on the cross, ready to take it all for mm-hmm. us. Was there a moment for you where you felt that love of the Christ intensely or or did, was it just a gradual opening up? Yeah, the, your- the night I pulled the gun out of my mouth, I felt a presence in there. I remember just being like, like it was like I couldn't even see because I was so like I was like my face was it was the most I ever cried. And I felt hope in that room. Like I felt like the decision I made that night to pull the gun out of my mouth and, and to give it another year was like like it was offered by Jesus himself in that room. And I just had to take it like I felt his love that night. And that was the transformative feeling that pushed me into the next day that kept that gun from going back in my mouth. And it has, has never left me since it has never left me. And Mm -hmm. it's something that we can all tap into. I believe that Jesus gives that to who he chooses, you know, and I think it, so something I've learned 
if you look at Adam, God created him from the dust of the earth. And I truly believe it, we have to die to ourselves in order for God to breathe life into us to be reborn. Mm -hmm. And so we're called back into that dust. We're called back into the death of our flesh for Jesus to even be able to fully take us back and, and, and make us believers. We have to legitimately die to ourselves, our pride, our sins, our addictions, our lusts, our everything, and just say, you know what, God, I can't do this anymore. That mm -hmm. rock bottom moment is when God can really lift you up. And you can't fake that. You can't fake it. Like I, 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 there's been times where I've, like, I intellectually know that at least in my personal experience, I've, tr I've tried to, I, I know that there's stuff that I need to dispel and it's like, and I, I intellectually know it, but unless it's like cathartic, unless you're like yeah. really, uh, you know, metaphorically or even literally on your knees of, uh, because I have been there too with other parts of my life. And I'm like, this is way different. Like this is this is so transformative. Whereas the other thing is like, I'm trying to go through the motions and it's not there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. do, you have any, do you have any advice or recommendations on if you're trying to work on something like that? And it's in man, you know what I mean? So I'm a true believer that it does take a, a rock bottom to change yeah. certain parts about you that you keep trying to get rid of, but they keep coming back. Although, I believe that you have a lot more power than you think as a man mm -hmm. and you have and you can control the things that you can control. So whether it's a habit you're trying to break or a pattern of relationships that you keep finding yourself in, like as long as you're aware of what is going on and you decide to walk away from it, which is a daily and sometimes minute by minute process mm -hmm. that you can go pretty far. But it's going to be like you said, it's going to be like, it's still there. It's still in your head. Like it's still calling you back constantly. When Jesus comes and takes it from you, you feel a disgust on these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had sex addictions, drug addictions, alcohol addictions. I've had, I mean, I've, I've quit every drug known to man, bro. <laughs> and, and I mean, pornography itself was one of the hardest things to quit ever. Yeah. When Jesus took it, it was gone. Like it was not me that did that. It's, Does it's, it ever come back now? Do you ever wrestle with any of those addictions now? Yeah, I yeah, definitely. They come back in situations where um, I'm in high stress or when, you know, I'm feeling betrayed or I'm not getting what I want. That's where I get triggered. Mm -hmm. So when I, I'm, I'm giving a lot and I'm not getting back, like I'm not getting what I want out of something, which is a total ego selfish thing. I, um, but, but it's also a good indicator that I'm in a place where I'm not fully surrendered mm. as well. Right. So it, it allows me to see, cause I've been there so many times. Okay. This isn't normal for me that once and the desires to go back, I need to make a change. And that's mm -hmm. when I, I just take it ownership and, um, inventory of myself and really ask myself, am I surrendering to God every day? Cause mm -hmm. one of the things I do every morning is I get on my knees literally and i tell god like i i spoil god and then i tell him like i'm nothing without you and i i go go through my head every cell in my body is being like you know it is called by god like i i think about every molecule in the world is like god is in full control like i picture that because i believe that we put such as we we take god's name and we put a picture to it and it's so much smaller than he actually is Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've had experiences that where I'm like, he is so unfathomably massive that yes. it's, it's laughable from our perspectives. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's impossible to have in this human realm to have any inclination as to how grand oh. this, uh, this force is, this power. Yeah. People die at oh. his, I mean, you know, he couldn't even show his face to Moses. He had to show his back. <laughs> He's like, you can mm -hmm. see my back Moses. Cause my mm -hmm. face will kill you. Mm -hmm. Like his his true face would just it's too much for us to handle we'd explode you know yeah but I mean, we're vessels of energy and that and that even the good energy could be too much to it's like trying to you know force a a, a dam through a little garden hose like it, it, you can't do yeah it. exactly yeah. fascinating man so talk to us about what you're doing now with immortal man your uh, men's group 
Yeah, man, just to keep it real simple, because I can make things complex and this doesn't help <laughs> explain anything. Yeah. I know, me too. Um, it, it's a it's a brotherhood. So we focus on uh on three different things. Number one is identity. So to get the man out of his own way, to help each one of these individuals understand who they are uniquely and why God created them. So help them find their purpose, help them understand their own core values, like what they believe in their mission in life. And then the second pillar is servant leadership. So we really take a look at Jesus's walk on earth and we learn after him and how he led and how he, I call it closing the gap. Because if you look at society and leadership, it's like, hey, I'm better than you. You do what I say. Jesus came down to our level, being a perfect God, and he didn't sit in the throne at all on this earth. He actually hung out with the drug addicts, the prostitutes, the alcoholics, the tax collectors, and he loved them to his level, right? So just looking at how he leads and how he serves and how he was able to build such a massive movement and influence so many people through his actions, his words, and how he got people to participate in it. So helping people build their teams, their family units, and lead them through the way Jesus did. And then our third pillar is legacy, right? So we believe that we all can leave something behind in people. Now we're all here to build God's kingdom too, but we all have our own ministries. We all have our own walks, our own missions, and we can't do it alone. So we teach them how to develop other leaders like Jesus came and he, you know, got 12 disciples to to spread his message. Right. And so blueprinting all these guys uh, legacies out and and try and making sure that they understand what they want to leave behind, because when you know what you want to leave behind, it changes what you do on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Right. Your life becomes more meaningful. Your day becomes more meaningful. You start to have more intention in your actions, your thoughts, the way you you hold yourself. Because, look, if you want to leave a crazy legacy behind and you want to lead people into greatness and you want to impact people, well, sh- you can't be walking around with a frown on your face, dude. So it changes the way you express yourself. It changes mm-hmm. the way you speak to people. Mm-hmm. Right. And it really just makes a man more influential. But by we do it by giving God the glory, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, helping men build their legacies and their empires, but making sure that they're doing it correctly. And then also um, teaching them the tools to impact people on like a massive level as well. So mm-hmm. simply put, we develop Christian men into influential leaders by unlocking their God-given potential. The brotherhood is accountability. So we have eight disciplines we do every day. And that when we are disciplined as men, God can use us in greater ways, right? We control what's in our body. We control what we do with our body, what we put in our mind. Um, you know, we were reading the word every day. We were praying and we're spending time with our family unit. God can really move us quicker, but also just providing the support that these guys need. Because, look, we can't lay everything on our wives. We can't lay everything on our families. We need our cup to be filled too. So this is a place where leaders can come in and we can support each other, lift each other up so that they can go out there and lead their people. Mm -hmm. Going back to what we talked about in the beginning of the conversation about the devil and the status of the world, what part of your Christian faith and or with your brotherhood, what are you teaching them to uh, how to push back? against that do you how where to draw the line and what does that actually look like what i'm wanting to get at is the the strength of christ we all know about turning the other cheek we all know about the compassion which is a beautiful um thing the forgiveness which requires i think tremendous spiritual strength however there is also these um incredible evils in the world um, such that you dealt with but on a massive scale right now that uh, maybe has been there all the time but we're just now getting up to speed, I guess. But I uh, even still, I think it may be the worst time, the scale of this. What are you doing to combat that? What does that look like? So, so in, in these men's life, obviously, we're we're teaching them to be the example that Christ is called to be, right? That's just a statement. But when we put it into action, it really makes a big difference in the people around us. We're, te- we're really teaching these guys to be authentic. And so we're holding them accountable to a lifestyle so that every single day they have things that they have to do in order to to not only build that character, but to keep it maintained and strong. Right. So no porn, no drugs, no alcohol, no cheat meals. Right. They have to be in the word every single day. They have to follow a diet. They have to do a workout every day. 
right? Now, if, if they slip on these things, those evils in the world that we're always called to, they have to let us know. They have to check in every single day. And because we're a brotherhood, the way we've built this is called a, a burpee atonement system. <laughs> and what leadership is truly like in, in real life is that when you start to slip in your life, right, your family pays for it. The people you lead pay for it. Right. They're not yep. getting they're not getting paid. They're not getting fed. Right. And that's reality. And so what we've done is we created this atonement system to where if you slip on your daily disciplines, if you slip on your if you don't show up to the call, if you don't show, you know do your homework each week because we have a course as well, then it counts as a certain amount of burpees. And every week we add that number up in our small group and the whole team has to pay for your slip ups. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Because the truth is, bro, I mean, I can give a guy a guideline and tell him to go live by. He's he's going to do pretty good for maybe a couple of days and he's going to fall off. But if his brothers have to pay every time he messes up, he's going to show up every day. And these guys do, man. Mm -hmm. It's insane. And I've tried multiple different ways of accountability. When you're held accountable only for yourself, (laughs) you will find a way to justify and make excuses to go right back to that old life. Right. But these guys at the end of the 12 weeks, they are completely different humans. We've wired into their brain that if they slip, everyone falls. Right. Mm -hmm. That, hey, I am the example. And, you know, I'm here. Everyone's depending on me. Right. Which is something that's been lost in society. I was just going to say in the world. I mean, that's why we're at where we're at right now. It's It's a me culture. One of our biggest models is it's not about us. It's not about us at all. I believe that self development was only meant to develop yourself to a level to where you should start leading people. Self-development has become Mm self-obsession. And and this is in a God, it says in the Bible, men will believe they're like gods, right? Mm -hmm. Women and men are out there in America. Like, it's all about validation. How can you serve me? People will step and tear each other down just to get to a certain level of fame. And that's completely backwards bro right and Mm -hmm. so what we want to do is we want to put christian leaders in high places i want to get some of these guys as president you know like that would be cool but in a way where they actually they were they were consistently in obedience with god to get there because that those men can change the world those men because it's not about them it's not about their paycheck right it's it's about everybody that they serve it's about the people that depend on them and jesus came to this earth not to be served but to serve he was perfect man came gave his entire life so that we may have everlasting life if we so choose and that is a perfect example of what we need to be doing as men is is building a life that makes an impact and suffering through that so that they don't have to mm-hmm you know what I mean? <clears throat> mm-hmm. what, what are some examples of the turnarounds that some of your clients have taken? Man, it- so we're we're about six months into launching, so we don't have any long, long-term long results, but we have um, guys that were on the verge of divorcing their wives and their marriages are like at the, at the peak it's ever been, right? Guys that felt disrespected by their wives, not understood, not acknowledged. Right. You know, you hear that from a man. My, my wife doesn't, you know, I'm just a paycheck. And some of the things that we, we taught that man was like, it's it, you are in a way, <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> your wife will appreciate you if you make her feel safe by being the servant, like by being her servant, by caring for her needs. So like we're, what we're teaching is like how to build a family unit by by you can't come into a a marriage and and expect something out of anybody right like jesus didn't he gave us free will god gave us free will so that we can even hate him even though he's still going to give everything we do if we if we live by that in our marriages it puts us in a place to where our wife feels safe enough to let go of what she's been protecting herself from which is maybe uh, a husband that didn't listen to her or didn't spend enough time, you know, one-on-one with her or whatever her love language is. And a woman, a wife's reaction, or when a wife's acting like that, it's because the man 
is not stepping up in his masculine role Mm -hmm. and and serving his wife, loving his wife as Jesus did the the church, Mm -hmm. right? Which is what what the Bible tells us. What we do is we come home from work and we're like, where's my sandwich? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. where's the sack? Like, I don't want to listen to you. I I'm just here to make money and give you money. It's like, bro, you put your, you made yourself a paycheck. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. So teaching them how to act as men and what the Bible shows us as, as husbands and how we need to work, how we need to live in our day to day. What you, if you're watching porn, you can't expect to have a good marriage. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's changed these guys' life just by changing who they are. It's so interesting to me how powerful relationships are, how they can be the most um, devastating element in a man's life and also the most enriching and how how difficult it is especially in our culture today with society just all the pressures and frankly the attacks the attack on um that relationship because that relationship is the pinnacle i think of the human expression of of god it is the masculine and the feminine coming together and when you have that whole and you when you have that in a healthy strong mature balance what do you have you have multiplication you have provision you have love um and so yeah. it makes it very clear that that's what an opposing force would want to attack you had some brilliant stuff i encourage anybody that's listening to this to go check out your instagram you have some really powerful um just little vignettes of off the cuff uh, you know sharing the word sharing your 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 inspiration and and some of them about testimony you're going to get tested until you have testimony and i just love that there's some really brilliant stuff which uh it's very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things I could say is that God will, most of the time, he'll keep you in suffering if you keep isolating yourself. And this is what I experienced my entire life is mm-hmm. I stayed in suffering because I wasn't willing to tell anybody and go ask for help. And, and the reason why he does that is because God cannot be glorified in your silence. Right. And so I, I just made a video on this the other day. I said, that a lot of like most people want to go into hiding to be healed and come back in the public and and pretend like they never needed healing at all right they just come show up and now they're batman it's like well hold on bro (laughs) what happened (laughs) and and it doesn't work like that right god will god will keep you in a dark place he'll he'll keep you in suffering until you decide hey like i'm ready to talk about this right our test becomes our testimony simply because god should be glorified in that transformation Mm. right god does your healing not you i'm sorry to say it your crystals won't do it you won't do it your your fitness journey won't do it you're separating from your husband or your wife and going on a drinking binge won't do it only god's going to transform you and by telling that story you're glorifying god in that right me being on this podcast telling my story is glorifying God, he's getting the uh, the award in this, not me. And what that does is that allows other people that have felt those pains that I've been through, or they're going through that, and they go, man, my way is not working either. Maybe I need to reach out to God, you know, mm-hmm. and he, he will heal you. But if I didn't tell my story, a lot of people want to be healed, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's my obligation as a man that has overcome things to tell it to the world and be honest and authentic about it. And that's what we're teaching at the immortal man to share your story and be, and to be the example. You can't just show up and say, Hey, I'm a great leader and have no backstory, bro. I'm sorry. Like people just won't listen to you, but we're in a mm-hmm. moment in our world right now where people are lost and broken and they need somebody to show them the way. But there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of mistrust. There's a lot of broken people, you know, hurting people. And so the only true way to get people to make moves and change their life is if you get down on their level and you say, I've been there so that they come in, you, you love them to your level, just like Jesus did. Mm-hmm. Right. I mm-hmm. believe that leadership is getting in the ditch and showing them how to dig their way out of it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not just standing on top of the pit and saying, hey, climb, bro. You know, <laughs> yeah. start climbing. This is what was so appealing to me about your stories. And I've found this to be true over and over and over again. In fact, I'm about to release a podcast this week with Shaka Singor. I don't know if you know who he is. Yeah, I looked him up. Yeah, amazing, amazing human being. And there's a 
gravity that your message carries um, w- through that authenticity and through the um, the journey that you've been through, where you've really dipped into the depths of hell and the human experience and uh, found your way back out of it. And there's there's such nuance that you can zero in on and go, ah, you're, you're a degree off, you know, you're, you're in the right direction, but there's a degree off that you can't get from somebody who hasn't been through that. Tell me what your relationship is like now with your son. Like what's, what's the objective for you as a father to give some clarity for those, especially single mothers who have young boys. Um, I know they're searching for how, how do I make sure I raise a young boy? What's, what are the important elements and principles that you want to make sure that your son learns? And, and let's just paint a picture of visualization so people have an idea as to what at least you think uh, it takes to raise a solid, strong man. Yeah. Well, number one is he needs to see you in your faith with with Christ. He needs your your son. And I'm going to speak to you know fathers with sons right now. It is the best thing you can do for your kids is not just to tell them about God and take them to church, but act, let them actively see you in prayer and consistently in the word and, and not just do it to put on a show. I'm talking about like your kid walks downstairs and, and you're on your knees praying to God, like put yourself in a routine of glorifying God, of, of having a relationship with God that your son can actively see every day, right? Your, your son will watch you go to work every day. And that will teach him as an adult, I have to go to work every day. We learn by example more than we do by words. And I know that for a fact because my parents tell me anything. I just didn't listen to them. But I watched my dad work hard and I became a hard worker. Mm -hmm. Right. I never watched my dad on his knees praying to God every day. And so that's something that I make sure my son sees is that I am not just in prayer and reading the word, but I'm also acting out in obedience to God, which means I'm not perfect and never claim to be perfect. But if I catch myself saying something that I shouldn't or doing something I I shouldn't, I will point it out to my son and I'll apologize. Um, Having humility as a man. But I would say the biggest thing that your son needs is that he, he needs discipline, but he also needs love. And discipline is love. It's a form of love. And God gives that form of love to us as well, right? He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But if you start walking away from him, you know, he's going to call you back. And and a lot of times that that it has to do with pain. And that's just a part of parenting. Right. I'm not going to tell you guys how to discipline your kids, but discipline needs to be a a main factor in your son's life. Because if your son is not disciplined, then he's going to go out there and he's going to do whatever he wants until he learns the consequences on his own. Right. Which can be a lot worse and a lot harder. And it's our job to have a controlled uh, environment to do that with our kids at home. But nothing is going to put a a heart of God in in, uh, good morals and discipline and obedience in your kid's heart if you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're drinking all the time, if you're always watching TV, if you're on your phone, like, like you have no right to even discipline your kid. I'm sorry. The reason why God's discipline works is because he's perfect. Have you ever had somebody like tell you not to smoke with a cigarette in their mouth? Are you going to listen to that person? Right. It's important that you speak from authenticity as a father over anything, because that is that energy transfer is real. I believe that people can smell you a mile away mm-hmm. when you're just giving people orders, right? That's the Especially whole thing. kids especially kids and they'll tell you to your face. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why I love them. Yeah. Yeah. You have to respect yourself for your kid to respect themselves, right? The way you live, the way you treat others, the way you let other people treat you is going to be a direct reflection of how your child lives. Mm -hmm. Two things I want to emphasize on that. First and foremost, I know there's some people listening going, well, I haven't conquered those things yet. So how do I discipline my kid while I'm still working through it myself? Um, and to me, that's a very clear calling to like, yeah, that's the point. Start to work on yourself. And to to what you were just saying, the kid's going to see that. Like I tell my kids, I struggle with my phone. Like I'm working on that phone addiction. I'm not there yet. So it's it's hard for me to say to them, put your phone down when I don't do it myself. However, when I do acknowledge to them, hey, dad's struggling with this too. 
So when I say to them, hey, let's put our phones away, I'm not telling them from a place of being on top of the pit saying, climb up. I'm saying, yeah. I'm down here with you. I'm, I'm, I'm working on this too. And I'm I'm being authentic about it. So it's a it's a challenge. Um, that's really good. I wanted to ask you too about a similar question about men in relationship with their wives or their their girlfriends. Yeah. What do you see as the primary role? We talked about provision. We talked about having your cup full enough so that you're not just a paycheck. You're you know, well, what does that look like? Give us a visual of what that is for you in your mind. Are you just talking about like securing like a strong relationship with with your wife? Yeah. Men often have such a hard time understanding and relating to the feminine. Uh, I've been on quite a journey myself where I've done a lot of training and conferences, et cetera, to better understand the masculine feminine dynamic. I've right. gone through my own relationship uh, growth as well. And uh, as I've come to better understand it, it's something that I think a lot of men still are trying to, you know, yeah. women, women are I hard to. To understand yeah, that's you know, from a male's perspective that jumps me into this like number one you have to be secure with yourself around women right because if you're unsure about yourself they're going to build off that <laughs> they're supposed to compliment us and if we we have nothing to be complimented on you know it, it gets chaotic so number one is like being secure with yourself and then the second thing is having emotional control you cannot have emotional immaturity around a species that runs off emotions. And that's a fact. Every time you react to a woman negatively in any any light, you're adding jet fuel to an already, you know, lit fire. Yeah. There's a saying is that women, they think in circles and we think in straight lines, right? Yeah. And there's just, we'll never understand why or how they think, like why they think like that and how they think. You'll never understand. If you want to be a perfect husband, learn how to read minds, you know, <laughs> but you can't. So you have to be able to communicate clearly with a woman. And the way to do that is by not being emotional, right? So many of us get emotionally disturbed and we react same thing with your kids right as a man like stoicism i love the stoic mindset and lifestyle i love it because like what happens is when a man gets emotionally disturbed in any way like our emotions come across very strong by the way and it's scary to a woman and your kids as as much as you are genuine and you're like oh i wasn't i didn't mean to be like that when you get angry a woman is, uh, becomes afraid of that. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest things. And then we, also when we get really like sad or stressed out, like they can't be there to help you because you, tr you transfer that energy onto them. And then because they're emotional creatures, they just absorb it and then they become it. Right. Can I challenge that for just, a, I want to push back yeah. on that just a little bit. Cause I do think that there is, um, I, I see some men take on this idea of stoicism, and become completely these, nothing can phase me, I'm this emotionless, quote unquote, rock. And I have found that that can be counterproductive. And to me, just to just to tweak a little bit what you're saying is, is not that we, um, I, I think what you're talking about is unglued emotion. Whereas intentional emotion coming from a grounded place, uh, the feminine can feel that groundedness. So you can bring a level of passion. You can bring a level, like imagine the movie Braveheart where he's riding in front of the troops and not expressing any emotion. You know, th there is there is a powerful place for emotion to reside. We are human beings, men are. Uh, we do feel emotions. And I think what you're talking about is really unglued emotions when they're out of control. Yeah, I'm talking about definitely only on negative emotions yeah anger a lot yeah. of men deal with a, a lot of anger suppression and then it comes out and it can be very Little scary jealousy yeah you know what i mean like shame i think in self-doubt like we will we act on it we just let it become a part like we let it overwhelm us mm -hmm. and, and it's just it ruins our days like when a man gets angry he can't just snap out of it so what i like to teach people is like when you start to feel that a negative emotion that's when you have to decide, am I going to react to this or am I going to do something to change my the state of my heart and my mind? Mm -hmm. Right. So what I one of the th things I, I like to say is that your emotions are real, but they're not reality until you react to them. 
once you react to a negative emotion, it becomes your reality. And then now there's consequences. Mm -hmm. Right. And I will say this, like personally, um, when a man in this world today, when a man reacts negatively to what's inside of his head, there can be major consequences, major consequences, Mm -hmm. especially if you're not necessarily with the right woman or a woman that is, is secure with herself. Mm -hmm. I think there's certainly some men who have dealt with some really nasty trauma that they haven't addressed yet. And so that anger continues to, it's like a volcano and it it continues to come out. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of times against their wife, against their children, uh, against themselves are really hard on themselves. Um, And so I do feel that they're, there's a place for needing to expel that anger because that pent up anger is oftentimes it's the unmet need of that wounded child that dealt with the trauma, oh. trying to find some place to, you know, Power. to be, to be seen and heard. Right. Yeah. Like we were talking about before. And so if you do, I'm just taking a little bit of a, a tangent here, just for those men who are in that place, you really do need something that like Eric is offering here with a brotherhood to be to, in my mind, the best place to expel that is in brotherhood uh, with yes. other men who understand the anger, who understand the isolation, uh, who understand um, tough love. And so you have a place to expel it. And then you can have that uh, accountability like you've been talking about and, and the love it, it, like anger is a normal emotion And that's one of the things I try to teach my kids is like, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be frustrated, but let's come to it from a place of authenticity. Let's come to it from a place of groundedness. Why are you angry? Tell me what's going on. You have an outlet. I'm I'm wanting to hear you. And I think that's something that women are seeking too. And sometimes they will, you might've heard this before the, the shit test, right? Where they're trying to almost compel some type of emotion, even if it's negative ones. Women are very, 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 very adept at uh, pushing certain buttons in order to get a certain reaction. And I've seen some men try to stay in that stoicism when she's trying to connect to, is there anybody there? Do you, do you feel anything at all? Can I do this to you and and get a reaction? Oh no. What about this? Well, what about this? And it creates this dynamic where she's (laughs) throwing bigger and bigger shit tests and he's trying to stay in his stoicism. And so I want to remind guys just on that one little caveat, I hear what you're saying and it's important. I just want to make sure that people do understand too that there is a time to say, you know, hey, knock it off, that you get to acknowledge the frustration within you, but do it from a place of authenticity. Do it before you get to the bursting point because that's not healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Here's the thing you got to know who you're with too. Yeah. You got to know who you are. That's that security. You also have to know who you're with. Like a lot of people are traumatized and a lot of people, a lot of men and women out there, um, have grown up with you know a father that didn't want to hear them out you know didn't want them to process their emotions didn't want to hear it kind of thing go to your room and so there's a lot of people that are coming in together as relationships that just trigger each other and Mm -hmm. they don't know the the fact is is like it's important that in every individual as a adult finds a way to understand who they are at their core, how they operate and why they operate in ways that they, that brings them a result that they don't necessarily like, right? Mm. Why do I get angry? Why do Mm. I use drugs when, you know what I mean? Albert Einstein said the same, the same brain, the same mind that creates a problem isn't the same mind that can fix it, Mm -hmm. right? That Mm -hmm. brain either has to adapt and learn from other brains or it uh, it has to ask for outside help to come in to solve that problem. And I love that because, and this, this is what men don't do is they isolate. They don't talk about their feelings. And so they just keep staying in this cycle that repeats relationship after relationship day after day. And they get left to a place where they actually are in isolation. They're divorced. They get fired. Right. So it's important to go out and seek brotherhood. I think brotherhood is the most important thing for a man, because when you tell your story or you explain what's going on in your life, what you're, what you're fixing, you will realize like 95% of men are going through the same thing. Yeah. And 5% have solved it and they have the answers for you. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. 
but you got to be in a place that it's okay to talk about those things because I'm going to tell you what, like not everywhere is a safe place to tell your feelings. I'll be real with, about that as a man. Yes. It's okay to express yourself. Yes. It's okay to be vulnerable, but if you do tell it to the wrong person, there's a high chance that it could be used against you. That's just a fact. This is a place you can you can come and talk about your stuff. Right? A lot of men, they get confused by the messages that they're hearing in society. On the one hand, it's suck it up, have all the answers, don't show any things in your armor, right? Um, have all the answers. And yet on the other hand, they're also hearing this message of like, you need to express yourself. You need to process your emotions. You need to. And the uh, I think the mistake that a lot of men make is that they do go to the women in their lives and almost like a boy to a mother, which that would be an appropriate place to say, I'm hurting mom, I'm struggling or whatever. If you're a boy, if you're a man and you go to your wife and you do that, the metaphor that I share with the men that I work with is to say, it's like, how would you like to be on the battlefield? And bullets are flying overhead. Your buddy just got shot in the face next to you, bleeding out. And you turn to your your commander and he goes, you know, I just I just want to tell you, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm really struggling. You know, exactly. it's like, that's not the place, dude. Like, yes. and I don't want to ever hear that from you. Like, go <laughs> handle your shit and come back. Exactly. That's the, and that's the metaphor that people, men need to know is like, go to the brotherhood, reach yes. out to, to someone like Eric handle that shit so that you can come back and be the leader that you are hundred percent. Yeah. Some woman can, you can tell them there's probably a small percentage of women. You could be like, I'm scared. And I don't think we're going to pay the bills this month. And she'll be like, I got this, you know, <laughs> she might have well, I, the I power know. of the woman, the power of the feminine in that moment to me in the, in the, in the highest level is to, is to remind him of who he is. That right. I have seen some beautiful, if you want to call it queen energy or just the mat the mature feminine who can understand that there are times where her masculine, her king is struggling yeah. and, and he has a deep enough relationship in respect of her where he can come to her and say, I lick his wounds a little bit and tail between his legs. Like I'm really, um, I'm, you know, help, help me. And, and they sister. have that bond. Yes. Two but that sister. takes a lot, man, to get to that level. Yeah. And you got to know who you are. You got to understand your identity. And so does your wife. I would say, you know, every we're humans and we're flawed and we all need our own support in a community outside of the marriage. Uh, I believe that God needs to be the center of your marriage. Otherwise, it's never going to work because where God isn't, the devil is. That's a fact. Uh, I believe that health is a very important aspect of relationships. You both are healthy and you're actively working on your on your developing yourself as people, as individuals mm -hmm. and as a couple. Um, I believe that, you know, alcohol and drugs should stay out of a marriage because they cause more problems than anything else. And yeah, man, I believe like that's it. It's simple, like your mental, your emotional, your physical and your spiritual health. Mm hmm as a team um but also as individuals because one person is unhealthy and the other person's constantly working on himself they're going to be unbalanced right it says mm -hmm. that god says to be equally yoked no he's speaking of the spirit but it's true to be said with health physical health emotional and mental health as well if one person is unequally yoked then one the other person is going to be carrying the weight Mm -hmm. You know, and that's going to mm -hmm. feel unfair. And that's when we start hearing the complaints of men saying, I feel like I'm doing everything and she doesn't care. And then it's like, if you keep doing everything, she's going to stay there, you know, and mm -hmm. now there's just this fat, unbalanced, you know, marriage, which almost always ends in divorce. Yes, it does. Yeah. Do you believe we're talking about the devil. Is that a metaphor in your mind or is, do you believe that there's a, a real evil that is the devil? Yeah, I believe it's a real, real evil. I absolutely believe in hell and the devil and demons. I believe that those are very real. I believe that everything in the Bible is 100% correct and true. We're, we're seeing some manifestations right now from the book of Revelation that are pretty, pretty specific. Obvious. <laughs> pretty yeah, pretty, exactly. pretty dead on. Yeah. Um, I'm not, that's the one thing I could rely on, man. If I start thinking like, you know, stuff in here is not real or true, then what, what do I have to lean on? You know, it doesn't mean I have to understand it either. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. a lot of crazy stuff in here. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand all of it, but I understand some of it. And I understand one thing is this is the truth. The word of God is, is the truth. It's the only truth that we have as humans to rely on. Everything else can be manipulated. Everything else can be like, you know, a pen. To you, this is a pen. To a dog, it's a chew toy. Which one's the truth? Mm -hmm. It's true for both, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we can all agree that we can see one thing and believe it's something else. And this is the only thing we can all as human beings rely on if we choose to. Can I ask you, what does repentance mean to you and how do you repent? Repentance is understanding the power and almightiness of God and comparing it to our broken, sinful flesh that will always self-destruct and will never be good enough to walk this life alone without destroying ourselves. Just that step one is understanding the difference between you and God. I am nothing without you. I am doomed to failure without you. And a lot of people say, I don't like that. The second part is the surrender and saying, I can't do this. God, will you do it for me? And then the third part is the forgiveness, right? If you truly repent, you'll walk away from sins that bind you, that you're that you've been bound to, like addiction. It doesn't mean that you won't fall back, but true repentance looks like a broken man seeking the love of God to save him from whatever he is bound to, which is sin. Mm. And it's a extremely emotional heart is the hardest almost most shameful i want to say shameful but just it's the most broken place you can be in but when god restores you it is the most beautiful transformation i believe that's where the transformation happens Mm. does it need to be heavy honest question uh genuine question does it need to be I don't know. I don't know everything, but (laughs) in my understanding of repenting, there's days where I'm just, I I do something that I I, I shouldn't. And I'm like, God, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't like, please help me not to do that again. Please forgive me. But in the back of my head, I'm like, I'm probably going to do that again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, it's not heavy that those are the moments. It's not heavy when I just, I'm not like fully done with it yet. It says in Jeremiah, it says like at the, um, Oh, when, when your heart can fully, it, man, I don't even know. It's, it's like when you, when your heart fully desires me, I will come to you. And like, those are the moments like in rock bottom, right? Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. just like, I, I, I can't do this anymore. Like the full surrender of the heart is when God can fully come and take and, and move you into a better place. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it has to be that heavy, but that's just how I've understood it is like, it's the authenticity of saying like i repent and you actually mean it like this those moments where i'm not fully authentic i know it's just like almost a prayer i'm just trying to get away from some shame and guilt for the moment Mm -hmm. knowing like hey i'm gonna drink this weekend you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and i think we've all had we can all understand that do you have a a favorite quote do you have a favorite bible quote that you turn to i've been um So this morning, I actually opened up to this, and I'm just going to read it. This is um, God's promises. It's 2 Corinthians 6.16. It says, these are the promises of God. I will live with them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And I love that because it's like four different things. I will live with you. I will walk among you. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's Jesus, right? That's actually a um, pulled from the Old Testament, I believe. It's in 2 Corinthians, but it was originally in, in Jeremiah when God was uh, promising, you know, to be saved from Bab- Babylon or whatever. He said that, like, I'm going to give you guys prosperity. I promise that I will send you like a savior and Jesus was that savior. Mm -hmm. So God saying, I will live with you and I will walk among you means that uh, the prophecy was fulfilled because Jesus, Jesus died. And then it talks about, it says, therefore come out from them and be separate. So knowing that Jesus died for our, we're called to walk in opposition of the world, which is the hardest thing to do. 
right? So you know that I've I've died for your sins. Now walk away from your sin. Like that's our first step as Christians is to walk away from sin, which is hard. And it says to touch no unclean thing and I will receive you, which is talking about like how the Holy Spirit can't truly move you in its full potential if you're still attached to sin, if you're still watching porn, if you're still, you know, drinking alcohol or whatever it is that you're doing. Mm-hmm. And then it says, and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. So it just talks about how we've been adopted by Christ. Jesus completed the father wound, right? The wound that we try to fill with money and drugs and titles and all that, like Jesus filled that. And I think that's the the greatest thing about Christianity is I think we're all seeking we're all created to seek um, acknowledgement from our father Mm -hmm. to be proud, our father to be proud of us. Right. Especially Mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll tell you, like when your dad's actually proud of you, it's a pretty cool moment. It's a beautiful moment, but if it's your actual dad, it's, it's never enough. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's never, Uh, it's, it's a cool moment when you're, when your biological dad does it. Um, But to me, it's a, to me, that's a manifestation of the divine father, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I, ideally, as fathers, we step into that. We we can be, be the best example of that because our children are needing that. They're wanting that from us. They think it's from us, but it really is. To me, I'm just the messenger, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it's cool because we're our lives, our family units, our walks as fathers with our, our children, are just like little glimpses into how God works, mm-hmm. right? It's written in our DNA. Beautiful. Well, this feels like a good place to tie up the conversation. I just want to acknowledge you, man, for one of the things that I look for in leaders is a willingness to be like, I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I'll figure it out. It, you know, And I, I'm a student too, and I'm learning. So I appreciate your humility. I appreciate the vulnerability. Um, what an incredible story that you have already. You're just getting started. And uh, I'm excited to have met you and had this conversation. I hope this was inspiring. Um, your message is so needed today, and it's an honor to talk to you, man, and to help amplify this story and to remind people God does have their back. I loved what you said about that. For those that are interested in finding more about you, about the brotherhood, and frankly, even to just I encourage people to just follow you on Instagram and receive the inspiration that you have, because it really is heartfelt and it really... Um, it's really powerful. Where can they go? Yeah. I mean, the real Eric Rogers all in one word is going to be Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. The best place to hit me is in Instagram. It's at the real Eric Rogers. If you've heard this message, I challenge you guys to reach out to me and let me know one thing that you took out of it or tell me how you related to it. I love hearing from people. Um, yeah, I just want to, I want to know who's listening and I want to see, you know, obviously if you need a brother in Christ, you know, that's what I'm here for. If you guys are going through something hard and you need direction, you need prayer, just let me know. I'd love to hear from you guys. Beautiful, man. If there was something that you got out of this, that was a powerful takeaway, please reach out to Eric. I'd love to hear from you too. Again, it's at the real Eric Rogers, correct? And I'm at Wired for Impact. Um, We'd love to hear from you. And I'm going to look into your Immortal Man men's group too. That sounds really powerful. I love the, I love that accountability. I've been in the accountability groups and if it's just on me, I'm like, "Ah, I'll I'll get the burpees in. But if I know the whole team's doing it, ah, that's, that, that hurts. That goes a little deeper. (laughs) When the group's doing 120 burpees, the next week we're doing like 20. Because people are like, that sucked. Yeah, we're not (laughs) doing that anymore. (laughs) Um, Well, thanks again, man. This is such an enlightening conversation. Thanks for having me, man. I hope your audience got value out of it. And um, again, if you guys get anything out, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear from you. But thank you, Peter. I appreciate you. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to this episode of Wired for Impact. If you're interested in creating and expanding your impact, be sure to visit us online at impactnow.com.